All right. So welcome to Wednesday, April 13th, 8 a.m. section. The recording is on. Uh, today, what we're going to focus on is beginning the fourth section of content for the semester, which is on multiples. So as a reminder, um, on Monday, your group project is due. We'll be uh, doing our presentations. So before we start our, our multiples conversation, any questions about your group case? Or issues with that? All right, remember 10 minutes, uh, use numbers, put everything you're gonna talk about in the PowerPoint, submit the Excel backups uh, to make sure you get credit for everything and uh, put screenshots in the PowerPoints as well. <clears throat> okay, and I put the sample presentations up from previous semesters if you wanted to use that to give you a sense of a format to think about for the section of the class. All right, well, again, if no questions, let's start talking about multiples. also known as comparables. So <clears throat> when we look at multiples or comparables, it's just a different way of doing the same thing, right? It's actually very much related to enterprise valuation I like to call it the shortcut, right? So uh, there's only one value for a company, right? Kind of, kind of what's called the law of one price. So however we value the company, we have to get to the same answer. So just because we changed our methodology doesn't mean we're gonna get a different result, right? Because there's just one value for a company. So the idea is what we're really gonna do is we're just gonna use an alternative way to get to the same answer. And that's what we're gonna call multiples a shortcut also known as comparables. The other piece with multiples is we are kind of working a little bit backwards, meaning when we do an enterprise DCF valuation, we start with the cash flows to get to a price. With multiples, we know the price. And so therefore we, we use that price to help us work backwards to better understand the valuation. But at a very basic level, a multiple also known as a comparable uses market prices of similar things to give you a benchmark for valuation, right? And the most common one, if you've ever started to think about buying a house, comes when you buy a house because you're gonna have to get the house appraised. And essentially the appraisal for a house is a multiples valuation, right? So what's gonna happen is that the person that's uh, doing the appraisal is gonna say, okay, you don't need to appraise this house. So I'm gonna look up some more houses that have sold in the last six months in this area, okay? And so we're gonna look at square footage, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms, uh, potentially lot size. Now it's not always apples, it's apples and oranges, it's not always one-to-one, -one, but they're gonna look for similar items. And they're gonna say, okay, these houses sold for whatever the price divided by the square foot to get essentially a price per square foot, okay? And that idea of a price per square foot is a multiple. And so the way they're gonna value your house, they're gonna say, okay, here's all the price per square foot that are selling in your region. Take your house, multiply by that price per square foot <laughs> times the square footage of your house, that's your valuation, okay? And then they'll adjust it up or down a little bit based on a few things, condition, again, lot size, location, et cetera, age of the house, but it's a basis for finding similar things, okay? So essentially that's the idea of a multiple or a comparable analysis. The only difference is we're gonna do this with companies. So if we find a company, we look for similar companies. Now, as simple as that sounds, that's actually the more challenging part is finding things that are similar, right? But the other reason why multiples can be helpful is they can be used to value a private company. Cause I can say, okay, if I have this company who's private and I have all those publicly traded peers, if they were public and they're very similar, they should probably trade at a similar price, right? But in order to do this, as I said, finding which companies you select 
starts to become very important. So typically what multiples do is they start helping you establish a range of prices rather than an exact price uh, for the company. Right? Now, as easy as multiples are, right? price per square foot times square foot equals value of the house. <clears throat> the problem is that to some degree, they're overly simple, meaning we're using one number to value the entire company, right? And when we look at things that are similar, they may be less similar than we think, because what we're about to find out is that multiples are just an express expression of growth and spread. And if you have companies with radically different growth and spreads and different capital structures, then they're probably not going to be as comparable as you think. Okay? But nonetheless, it, it is a, a simplified version of valuation that is a pretty common practice. Okay? So the steps to do a multiple analysis are, are pretty straightforward. Right? It's a five-step process. Right? So the first step is, and this is actually, again, one of the most important things, find a peer group, find similar companies. And, and by similar, they should have similar profiles, similar financial profiles, similar operating profiles, similar kind of margins, similar growth rates, similar levels of overall uh, performance. Because uh, if they're far different, then they're not going to be as comparable. Then once you find the range of companies, then you have to start essentially gathering data. And typically we're going to use Bloomberg, but there are several data services that you can use out there to help you get data on the financial prices and other statement data of these companies. And, and some of these services like Bloomberg will calculate this for you because that would be the third part. Then you have to calculate the multiples and then you have to benchmark. You have to kind of compare all the companies and, and see how they stack up and, and see what maybe might be some differences in some of those numbers that uh, lead to similar or different multiple results. <clears throat> and then if you're gonna basically use this data, then you're gonna take your calculated multiples to help create a range for that group. And if you're trying to benchmark, for example, a private company or an M&A, et cetera, then you would use that to help you think about what those prices could be. Okay. So pretty straightforward process for going through multiples, right? So a few best practices that the book talks about. So number one, find companies with some more prospects, particularly around ROIC and growth. And then you'll see that as we go through the material, why that's gonna be start to be very important. Forward multiples are more important. Again, very important in the book. You know, we are trying to establish the value of a company. The value of the company is based on future cash flows, not historical cash flows. So therefore, we're more interested in future multiples rather than historical multiples, right? And that's going to be very important. Also, we tend to prefer, we'll talk about more in a minute, enterprise value multiples rather than PE multiples, okay? Because they tend to be more normalized for companies. And... <clears throat> Again, you might have to make some adjustments to multiples. So for example, you have two companies, all identical in every way. One company's got a bunch of non-operating items. The other company doesn't. They're not as comparable because the non-operating items. So you can adjust for the non-operating items and make them a little bit more comparable, okay? So just make sure that you are really looking at things that are truly comparable. So you might have to make some adjustments as you go through the process. Multiples can also be used for something called precedent transactions, okay? And, and so again, this is where we'll call M&A, right? So if I'm gonna do an, an acquisition, then what I can do is I could say, okay, how, how much did people pay for some more things in the past, right? So that's called a precedent transaction, right? And, and so again, that's gonna be useful if, for example, you're working with a private equity firm, investing in non-publicly traded companies, um, or even you're a venture capitalist trying to figure out what your company could eventually trade for if it could go public or be sold. Uh, and again, M&A. So again, the whole idea is multiples in the past can set a precedent uh, for what the price could be in the marketplace. And so essentially gives you ideas of additional similarities. But again, <clears throat> this has challenges, right? Because number one, you don't have a lot of information sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with private companies. So some of the data you have is a little opaque and, and the, maybe the data isn't as comparable as you think. And the timing matters. So for example, if you're doing an acquisition today 
given everything that's going on in the real world with spiking inflation, rising interest rates, uh, uncertainty over economic conditions, what's going on with the war, it's probably going to be a different valuation than it was six months ago when everything was much more peaceful, interest rates were still low, people didn't have big expectations of the challenges of the future, and so values might be different uh, because of the timing. And again, finding truly comparable companies. Just because an acquisition happened in your industry four years ago doesn't mean that that company is truly comparable to who you are today. And so even though we'll sometimes do that, we got to recognize that there are some limitations here. And sometimes we do multiples. If you're doing an acquisition, synergies aren't always part of that. So for example, if I go buy somebody, the whole idea is that we're better together. I'm giving them something they otherwise wouldn't have, and therefore I can scale them faster. I can reduce some of the costs that they have. And so as a result of that, that pricing may in the multiple wouldn't necessarily include that. So I have to kind of infer what that could be. For the semester, you're gonna be responsible for essentially four key multiples and, and three primary, right? So we're gonna talk about what's called the price to earnings ratio or PE, and then three enterprise value multiples, EV to sales, EV to EBITDA and EV to EBIT, okay? So those are the four multiples that we are gonna continue to talk about, right? So let's talk about what we mean by a multiple. And so I'm gonna start out with the key value drivers formula, okay? So if you remember, we've developed key value drivers throughout the semester. And so here's the idea. If we take the key value driver formula, which is, version of it over here. This formula right here, okay, right, that we've been using for, for example, continuing value and other things to understand what's going on with companies. And I'm going to do a table. So using that equation, I'm going to plug in some values. We're going to start out with $100 of no pad or no plat, or 100 million of no pad or no plat. We're going to assume a 10% WAC, 10% cost of capital. And then in the formula, we're going to plug in these G's and these ROICs, right? And then the results of that show up here. Okay. So these are just the results of the key value driver formula, that profit, that whack, different G's, different ROICs. That's the, the table results. Okay. So first question to the group, why is this column value staying at a thousand or a billion? Why is it not changing based on the results of this table? It's because RRIC is the same uh, percentage as cost of capital. Yeah. So with zero spread, there's no value for any growth, which means as we have negative spread, that's six and eight over here, less than 10% cost of capital. The more we grow, the more value we destroy. Positive spread over here, the more we grow, the more value we create. Okay. Kind of core concepts of what we've been talking about this semester just kind of seeing it laid out in a table given the different results, okay? So here's how a multiple would be created. So we'll call this the enterprise value, all right? These results, so the same table as the last page, this is the enterprise value, the value of the firm, okay? So we know non-operating assets, keep it real simple. So operating and enterprise value, essentially the same. <clears throat> so here's the deal. If we have a 35% tax rate, throw one out there, and we have $100 of no PAT, profit after tax, then pre-tax, we'd have 154 of EBIT, okay? So I'm just working backwards. This is just this, put the tax back in, and you get to 154, okay? So this is my pre-tax profit that gets me to the after-tax profit of that tax rate, just work backwards, right? So I have 154 approximately of EBIT. So here's the deal enterprise value to EBIT multiple. Take the thousand divided by 154, that's 6.5, okay? And so the idea is this zero spread means trading at a 6.5 multiple. Okay? What would it mean if a company was trading at a multiple of six. What could we infer about a company trading at a multiple of six? 
I mean, first of all, where are the sixes on the table? And, and what would that mean if you were in the six range? All right, so nobody wants to volunteer. Yasmin. Yasmin Mulcara. What would a six mean? Yasmin, are you in the class? Yes, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, how about uh, Charlie Zhang? I'm not re really sure either. Okay. Is anybody sure? What would a six mean? So Charlie, since I was picking on you, where are the sixes? Like over here? What could oh, we yeah. say about the key value drivers? Here's a six and somewhere in here is a six. So I can almost draw a line. If I did the results, my sixes would be somewhere in this range. Okay. In fact, I'll even I'll draw it for you. This is the pen. So my sixes would be somewhere in this range where that red line is. So what could you say about the data given sixes? What would create a six? Um like a growth range of between one and three percent. And what about the ROIC? Um, between six and eight. Yeah, but more importantly, six and eight is less than 10. What does that mean? The ROIC of six and eight is less than the WAC of 10. What's that again? What do we call that? Uh, is it like the, the negative spread? Exactly. Sorry, just leading the witness there. Thank you. But but that's the idea. Like if a company's trading in a multiple of six in this industry, one of the things we can infer is they likely have a negative spread and a pretty low growth rate. I can't tell you exactly what their ROIC is because a couple of different ROIC growth combinations could give me a six, right? And that's the point of multiples. But generally, if a company's trading at six in this industry where six and a half is break even spread, then most likely they probably are having a negative spread. Same thing. If a company is trading at a multiple of seven times earnings, here's a seven, here's a seven, somewhere in here's a seven. There's several different combination pairs. I could be 312, I could be 214, I could be one somewhere around 16-ish, right? And, and so that's the point. I can't tell you exactly which one it is, a company trading at seven times EBIT may have any of these pairs, but what I can tell you is they're likely to have a positive spread at low growth. And, and so that's the point about comparables is that if I see a company that's trading at about seven times, and somebody else is trading about seven, three times, I know in this industry, they probably have a positive spread. If there's a bunch of companies trading at four or five times multiples, they probably have a negative spread because here is where my break-even spread is for this industry, right? So that's the whole point of multiples. That's what I mean by it overly simplifies the values of the company. It doesn't tell you exactly what you're worth, but it helps you understand where you are along a range. Make sense? Questions? Oh, I have one question. Yeah. If a company's EV to RI, so sorry, uh, EV to EBIT ratio is currently like, say if it was 7%, Mm -hmm. um, but you saw that they have a negative spread. Is that like an indicator that they will, like, like, they will likely have a negative spread in the future? Well, I would say, let's say the company today, just for answer your question, had an ROIC of eight, okay? And a 2% growth rate today, but they're trading in a multiple of seven. What does that mean? That's basically your question. How do you get to a multiple of seven if you have a negative spread? Uh, 
would you just have a, like a higher e, uh, EV or sorry, a higher enterprise value or lower um, EBIT? I understand, but how do you then get to a higher multiple? So you either have distorted numbers because you have no profit or whatever, or let's say it's a real enterprise value of seven, the data supports it. It's an expectation. So today, because I told you multiples are about the future, today the company has a negative spread. But if they're trading at a multiple of seven, what the market is inferring is that this spread is likely to turn positive. So that's a really important question that you asked and, and an insight, which I'll probably use in later classes today, because a lot of people miss that. Because that was the whole point when I said we use forward multiples, because the, the multiples are looking at the future. Because the, the whole idea of an enterprise value or a, a, a common equity value, it's all about my expectation for the future. And so that's built into the price. And so multiples to some degree are, are also considered a leading indicator of where the firm is going. And that's another reason why multiples can confuse a lot of people because you're looking at either current and historical data. And if you look at current and historical data, profit, for example, being historical data, <clears throat> then that may not be representative of the future. And so if the past is different than the future, the multiples might be different. And that's a nuance that could be passed up by a lot of people. So really good question. Other questions about this? All right. So this key value driver's equation can actually be used to create a price to earnings multiple or what's known as a real PE in the real world, not just an enterprise value multiple, okay? And the whole idea is when you do a price to earnings multiple, what you're doing is you're doing a cash flow to the shareholder. Equity is income. Income is net income. That's profit. That's shareholder equity. So when we do valuation, ROIC is based on free cash flow. Okay? Free cash flow is profit after reinvestment. That's what's up here. But cash flow to the shareholders, if I just stripped out all the debt, is essentially the same formula. Net income minus reinvested net income equals the cash flow just to the shareholders. Because if you remember when we did the rearranging of the statements to Midigliani Miller a few classes ago, the idea was we said we could work across, we could work down, we could kind of add things up and break them apart. So that's the whole point. If we just stripped out and looked at purely equity cash flows, net income minus reinvested equity equals the cash flow to the equity holders. That's what's left, pay out the theoretical dividend or share repurchase. And when we, we forecast G, we could swap in forecast growth is take your return in equity times the reinvestment rate and it's the reinvestment rate of the equity, okay? Equity over here, that's the reinvestment rate. Okay? So here's the point. We can take the key value driver formula Swap out no PAT becomes net income. Growth in no PAT becomes growth in net income. Return in investing capital becomes return in equity. And WAC becomes cost of equity. Because we're going to discount the ca equity cash flows with an equity valuation. So therefore, we need an equity discount rate. So same formula, just have the equity values take out all the debt. Okay, And essentially, that's a PE. So next slide. So taking this formula, the equity values, at this net income of 100 million, at this cost of equity, not WAC of 10%, here are a range of return in equities. Here are a range of growths, plugging them into this formula, key value error formula. We get those values right here in the middle of the screen. So these are essentially the table values, kind of like we did the enterprise value, just key value driver with these Gs, these ROEs, these net income cost of equity salt. Here's price to earnings multiple. Take value, price, divided by income, earnings, P divided by E, multiple of 10. Same concept. Companies that have multiples less than 10, likely have negative spread. Companies that have multiples greater than 10 
likely have positive spread. What's key to the comparables, similar risk. If they don't have the same cost of equity, then the multiples are not gonna be calculated the same way. Okay, that's why it's important to find similar companies. All right, well, again, we'll see that more when we start playing with the actual formulas. Right? But that's the whole idea of a PE rip multiple. That's all it is. It's just take your profit over here, take your value, earnings or value price divided by earnings P. Okay. So again, if companies were trading at a multiple of nine, well, somewhere in here is a nine, somewhere in here is a nine, same idea, probably somewhere in one to 3% growth, somewhere in six to 8% ROE. That's the expectation. Over here, companies trading a multiple 12. Well, here's a 12, somewhere here. Here's a 12. Companies probably have somewhere around 14 to 16% ROIE, 3 to 4% growth. So again, I can use the multiples to kind of help me understand the values working backwards. I can use the values to drive the multiples. These things will work forward and backward. Questions? All right. So that's the concept of a multiple. That's how they're created. Key value drivers creates them. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of the session that we tend to prefer enterprise value multiples over price to earnings multiples, right? And the reason why is because even though PE, price to earnings, is probably one of the most common multiples out there in the real world, and it's fairly intuitive, we just did one, right? It's actually the hardest to explain. And the reason why is it's the hardest to explain is because PE is based on net income, equity, right? And profit and or EPS, earnings per share, right? And so here's the point. Net income is an accounting number that first of all, is the last item after everything else has been paid. So if you're trying to explain how that earnings drives the value, you have to talk about everything above, which means you gotta understand the margins, right? both gross margin and operating margin. You got to understand whether or not the company has debt because capital structure will change the net income. One company with debt will not have any interest. Another company with debt will have interest. So even if they're identical, the company with debt will look worse. It'll have a lower net income, okay? So you got to explain how differences in debt will affect the net income. If the companies have different tax rates, you'll have to affect how they have different tax rates. If the companies have different non-operating items or one-time charges, those will affect net income. So the point is net income just has more items that you have to explain when you try and understand the multiples across companies. <laughs> Enterprise value, which is based on typically EBIT or EBITDA, doesn't go as far down the income statement and doesn't include everything below EBIT, which means they tend to have more normalized results across companies, regardless of capital structure, okay? regardless of non-operating items, right? Now you can still adjust for those, but the point is the enterprise value multiples tend to be less distorted, okay? Than the price to earnings multiple. And that's why we tend to prefer the enterprise value multiples over the price to earnings multiples. But people will use both and you're gonna be looking at both as we go through the semester. <clears throat> so let's talk about enterprise value multiples. How do we get to an enterprise value to EBIT? And the whole point is, theoretically, there actually shouldn't be differences, right? Now, again, real world, you see struggle explaining because there tend to be more items, but if there are not a lot of non-operating items and the, and the capital structure is the same, there probably aren't gonna be a lot of differences. So let's go back to enterprise value. How do we get to EV to EBIT? We'll start out with the, the key value drivers equation here. And we're just gonna rearrange it. So it's no plat or no pat times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. Well, no pat is basically EBIT after tax. EBIT times one minus the tax rate. And so if we do an enterprise value to EBIT, divide both sides by EBIT, enterprise value to EBIT is one minus the tax rate times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. By the way, this is the formula for enterprise value of the EBIT. 
it's just a rearranged key value driver formula, right? This is what we use for PE. This is what we use for EV to EBIT. That's the whole point. One value, we gotta get to the same answer. So the idea that we're just rearranging the math to get to the same answer is really all multiples are, right? But nonetheless, here's the other interesting point. This is the formula we use to estimate G in our valuation models, okay? Because they're based on the free cash flows, because they're based on the key value driver formula, right? And we know that they all have to sync. Right? But regardless, this is how you get to enterprise value to EBIT. Okay? Now, when you actually apply this to the real world, there could be some variations. And again, where would the variations be in the enterprise value to EBIT? Again, companies have different tax rates. They're going to have different EV to EBITs. If companies have different growth rates, they're going to have different EV to EBITs. If company has different ROICs, they're going to have different EV to EBITs. If they don't have the same risk profile, different wax, they're going to have different EV to EBITs. So this is what I'm saying, like finding comparable companies, because all these things have to be similar to get a similar value. If they're not similar, you're not going to get a similar value. Therefore, not com comparable. You can't compare Twitter and Google. They have far different growth rates. They have far different levels of return. They have far different risk profiles. So therefore, looking at their multiples, they're really different. And they're far less comparable just because they're in the tech industry. Doesn't mean they're comparable. They're at different stages of the life cycle, right? They're, they're just different. And, and that's what we have to recognize. And they're going to have different growth return combinations and different risk profiles. So therefore, they're going to trade different multiples. And we got to understand that. All right, third multiple is EV to revenue, okay? Or what's known as EV to sales. Same thing, we've already used this in the valuation model. How do we get to EV to revenue? Well, enterprise value to revenue, start with the key value driver equation. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, this is no plat. So no plat is revenue times margin. EV times one less tax rate over revenue. It's our no plat. Okay? So we're going to divide both sides by revenue. And so what we're left with is enterprise value to revenue is our margin times one minus tax rate, give you to revenue, one minus tax rate, and all this is left. Okay, so this is the enterprise value to revenue. So here's the interesting thing. All of this is the EV to EBIT formula. So therefore, Enterprise value to revenue is margin times EV to EBIT. Again, rearranged math. Direct relationship between key value drivers and the enterprise value or to revenue or EV to sales multiple. And EV to sales, enterprise revenue, interchangeable terms. So it's just EV to revenue is your estimated margin, EBIT divided by revenue times the enterprise value to EBIT multiple. How did we estimate margin in our valuation model? EV to revenue is EV to revenue divided by EV to EBIT multiple is our margin. That's EBIT to revenue. That's what we've already been doing for the last few weeks of the class. But again, the whole point is law of one price. These are just rearranged equations that basically give you the same value. And that's how we're gonna start getting more insight as we try and do it. I'll pause. Questions about any of this? All right. So let's jump to the real world and start applying this. <clears throat> easier to share a desktop. So we'll do that. Share. Desktop. <clears throat> so earlier this semester, we had the little key value drivers spreadsheet 
that we talked about in class. And we talked about the four scenarios for creating value. Like what happens if you change growth? Nothing happened. What happens if you change growth over here? Value went up because they had a positive spread. What happens as the growth rate slowed? The value of the multiple came down. What happens if you grow a negative spread? The more you grow a negative spread, the worse off it is. Okay. Those were the key value driver lessons that we've established earlier in the semester uh, for the companies. But notice what we did when we did the key value drivers is we use the key value driver equation to basically create a value, no different than here in our PowerPoint. When we use the key value driver equation to create this table of results, it's basically just this data and snapping in a table, same idea, same formula creates these values. Value divided by profit is the multiple. That's the whole idea. That's how we got the same value divided by profit. The next slide became the multiple. Okay. And so essentially, this shows you the relationship between the two. Okay. Except here's the difference. What we're going to do is instead, let's do a company. Okay. So let's say we do Walmart. So here's how we'll start doing the multiple for Walmart. We'll do a price to earnings multiple, okay? So let's go here and look up Walmart. So we're gonna need a few data points, right? So first I'm gonna need a cost of equity. Not a WAC, cost of equity, because I'm doing PE, remember the formula. So I'll type in WAC. This is where I get both the WAC and the cost of equity. There's Walmart's cost of equity. There's Walmart's WAC. Okay. So today, Walmart has a cost of equity of 7.4%. So let's go over here and let's say this is, and I'll insert a column. So if I'm going to do a PE, then this is actually expected net income. This is my growth in net income. This is my expected return on equity. And this is my cost of equity. Okay, So same four elements. I'm just doing these four items here. So let's talk about what is my cost of equity for Walmart. Well, we just said it's 7.4%. Yeah. Now, I need expected net income and I need return on equity. So let's come over here. And where do we get expected net income? EEO. This is Walmart's consensus earnings estimates for today, for the next four years, actual four forward years. As I hinted to you earlier in the semester, and as the book talks about, we want to use a future multiple based on future earnings to do a future value of the company, right? And so therefore, we care more about the forward earnings than we do the historical earnings. We get better multiples that way, right? But multiples being created the same way on this table, okay? So for example, this is 2023 net income right there. So... Here's the point. This is 2023 earnings per share based on that income. How do you do a price to earnings? Price divided by earnings per share, PE. Actually, PE is 22.47. Okay. Price divided by 2024 earnings per share, PE. Price divided by 25 earnings per share, PE. Okay. That's just the multiples. Bloomberg's just creating these for you, so you don't have to do this by hand. Right? <clears throat> so back to this. We care more about the forward multiples than the historical. So this year, as we talked about, includes both historical and, because we're in April, and this is based on the years already started for 2020, their fiscal 23, okay? so. February, March, already done. 
they're now in April. So this includes a combination of forecast and actual data. The second forward year, you can count over one, two, is a clean 12 month forecast. Again, these tend to be more normalized when we do multiples. So we wanna use these clean forward years, right? So for our purposes, we'll simplify and say second forward year. Okay, so Walmart's PE. So basically right now, their net income expected in 2024 is 19,705. Their expected return on equity, if you actually go back here and you keep scrolling down, you'll see that the analysts are forecasting a return on equity because essentially they're forecasting the profit into the balance sheet, they can forecast a return on equity. Now, you can scroll down or you can minimize to the bottom half of the screen. So there are the next four year forecasted return in equity. So we need a return in equity for Walmart for the future that is representative of perpetuity, okay? So the next four years at least are 21, 22, 22, 19, okay? So a couple of ways we could do this. We just average the four if we think that that's representative. We could come up with what we think is representative, but that's the point. We needed a representative long-term return in equity. Okay, so 21, 22, 22, 19, let's say somewhere around, I don't know, I'm gonna call 20 a long-term return in equity, okay, somewhere range. I could also just take these four and average them out, but let's do 20 as a representative long-term return in equity given the next four years. Okay, so this is the key value driver formula. Just copy the formula and be lazy. So here's the point. If we plugged in these three values to the key value driver formula with zero growth, zero G, Walmart would be worth 266 billion. Walmart's PE, PE would be the 266 billion of value, operating equity value, divided by profit, PE, they would trade at a multiple of 13.5. So with no growth, Walmart would trade at a multiple of 13.5 if they had a 20% return on equity in the future at a 7.4% cost of equity. And given their profit times earnings, that would be their value, about 266 billion. Now, the actual PE for Walmart today is not 13.51, unminimized. House problems reload the screen. Um, the actual PE for the second forward year, that's what we're talking about, is 21.02. So come here, 21.02. So this is what this little model gets us. This is what this is the equity value, aka price. Right. So the model says with no growth, they'd have a PE of 13.51. They're actually trading at 21. So obviously they expect growth. What if they grew at 2% G? You know, we kind of solve for a G that makes all this work. Well, it's going to be higher than two, three, higher than three. As I said, lazy solver data. Software again, I'm forgetting the version of Windows I'm in. Um, what if? So, what I'm going to do is go to the what if, and I'm going to use goal seek to say set cell E9 to 21.02. So, I want to get these two to match by changing E3, which was the G's. So, if it solves for a G, Three and a half percent. This is Walmart share price today. That income at that growth long term, at that return in equity, at that cost of equity is that multiple. By the way, earnings times multiple is the price. 
with the key value to our equation. Multiple Walmart's equity value should be about $414 billion, assuming non-operating items. So there's probably a few non-operating items, but somewhere around here should be their share price. So by the way, let's go back to Bloomberg. And I'm going to do a DES because on the DES screen right here is what's called the market cap. Market cap is share price times shares outstanding. For Walmart, 421 billion, 655 million. Theoretical value, pretty darn close. Right. And I knew it would be. Like I didn't know I was gonna do Walmart 20 minutes ago. I just kind of thought about it on the fly. But that's the point. Like I, I knew that if we did the key value driver equation, we'd come pretty close to the share price because they have to, right? That's the point. Otherwise there'd be arbitrage opportunities. There's one value for Walmart, rearranged math gets there. I know that this is just the rearranging of the math. I get there, I can back into the Walmart share price. Just like we did an as is valuation in the DCF, we can essentially do the equivalent of an as is valuation in multiples. Again, pause, questions, but any of this. Well, let's continue on. That's Walmart's PE. Now, rearranging the math over here, we get to this equation. Enterprise value to EBIT. Okay. So to get to an enterprise value to EBIT, we need to know a few more pieces of data. Right? We need to know their tax rate. We need to know their G, which this G is not the growth of net income. This is the growth in the no plat. We need to know their ROIC, not their ROE, and we need to know their WAC, not their cost of equity. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put, so I find myself in the equation. I'll put the equation over here. There's enterprise value to EBIT. Okay, so again, we'll do Walmart. So what do I need to know? I need to know the tax rate that Walmart is gonna pay. I need to know the G for Walmart. I need to know the expected ROIC, because the future, not the past ROIC, <clears throat> and I need to know the WAC. And if I know that, I know the EV to EBIT. And again, I can also look in the real world to see the actual EV to EBIT for Walmart. Okay. So what is the tax rate? <clears throat> well, same process. I care about the forward tax rate. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go to guidance, GUID, and I'm going to look up Walmart tax rate and see if there's any guidance for tax rate. There is 25%. Right. So enterprise value to EBIT, tax rate, 25%. Same principle, G is the most volatile number. Doesn't take too much Gs to change these multiples as you start to realize. So that's the why I always solve for G because it's the hardest to forecast, right? So therefore we're gonna kind of solve for a G that gets the EB to EBITs to match. Same thing we did in our valuation model, right? So the only difference is when we did our valuation, we know a pretty good idea of what the ROIC is, right? Now, the problem is if we don't do the full valuation, what do we use for our ROIC? We need a future ROIC that's representative. Well, part of the reason why I chose Walmart is because I think the past really is prologue, meaning Walmart today probably looks a lot like Walmart tomorrow, right? If you think about it, Walmart's margins have been fairly consistent and if you look at even when we go back to EEO, this return in equity year over year doesn't change all that much. Well, if the return in equity is not changing all that much, the ROIC is probably not changing all that much. Right? And, and so therefore, my ROIC at a target capital structure is probably consistent over time. It's probably not too different, might be slightly higher than today, but it's probably not too different than today. So here's the point. If we go to RV, 
and we go to custom, we actually have an ROIC for Walmart today. Okay. But this ROIC is Bloomberg's ROIC and includes non operating items. So we actually have a custom formula called operating ROIC that we have created. Who's not finding it? Uh, custom field. Why is it not finding my custom field? Search. Hop. No. Why Bloomberg's not finding my custom fields today? Oh well. <clears throat> I want to use my uh, formula. Change the formula library. It's kind of weird. This is like a completely different. Is. That's weird. Operating ROIC is right there. Use an RB. Um, I have it that way. Usually it's just your custom formula should show up right there. But the point is here is the operating ROIC for Walmart. Here is the Bloomberg ROIC for Walmart. We always talked about this being the preferred one. And what we said is this is probably today not too different than tomorrow. Fairly consistent margins, fairly consistent ROICs. So usually I'd want to forecast, but in this case, because Walmart's a pretty stable firm, I think this might actually be representative of the future. Okay, so I'm going to use this, 14%. So let's go back to here. And let's put in 14.09%. And finally, today, Walmart's WAC is 6.8%. So here's the point. We have a tax rate, we have an ROIC, we have a WAC, and so we just want to solve for a growth. Their actual EV to EBIT is EDO. Where is it? EV to EBIT, second forward year, right here, 2024. Count over the columns, one, two. 16.51. Uh, And I need to create a model EV to EBIT that matches that. So I can figure out what Walmart's growth is, then I know what the market's expecting for Walmart. So here's the point. I need to put that formula in that cell. So that formula equals, we again did this in our valuation model, one minus the tax rate times one minus the growth divided by the ROIC, right now growth zero. Take all of that. And divide by the WAC minus the growth. So basically, without any growth, the EV to EBIT multiple would be 11. And multiple for Walmart today is at 16 and a half. So obviously the market's expecting growth. Let's put it in 2%, it's probably higher than two. <clears throat> Now remember this G is growth in no plat, this G is growth in net income, right? But three, somewhere in there, it's probably fairly close, right? But here's the point, I can use my solver again, I wanna be lazy. So data, what if, I'll seek. So I wanna set cell EB to EBIT to match the current one, 16.51 by solving for the growth. And the answer is 3.3. .3. So that's Walmart's operating values that lead to their EV to EBIT. This is Walmart's equity values, which leads to their PE. We understand Walmart's multiples. So Walmart, which has 
that ROIC, that WAC is trading at this multiple. Questions about any of that? We did evaluation on Dollar General. So let's do a comparison. Let's assume Dollar General is comparable. Let's see what we can learn about Dollar General. Okay. So, DG. So, first thing I'm going to do PE, WAC. This is their cost of equity, 7.5. This is their WAC, 6.4 for Dollar General. 6.4, 7.5. So these risks are fairly similar. Okay. Next, let's do EEO. This is second forward year net income, 27.34, smaller company. <clears throat> This is expected return in equity, 41, 45, 44, 44. So I'm going to call it 44. I would probably average those out, but they look pretty consistent. So again, take the formula over one, solve for the G, set cell. They probably put my PE in. PE is oh, the EEO screen. <clears throat> right now, for Dollar General, second forward year, 19.43. So 19.43. Right. So I'm going to solve for the model PE to match. So what if? Cool sink. So I want to set cell here to 19.43 by changing that. Oh, it would help if I put the formula there. Copy, paste. All right, there we go. What if, cool seek, set cell here with the formula at this time to 19.43 by changing this. So won't, so Dollar General is here. Right. Back to Dollar General. Now we did evaluation Dollar General. So I'm actually gonna pull up my Dollar General valuation which was, where was the dollar general there is? We did an as is. So dollar general, we had used a tax rate of, twenty two seven five. back to my Excel file, tax rate, 22.75%. We came up with an ROIC in perpetuity based on their assumptions of about 12.4%. So 12.4. <clears throat> so essentially, formula. The actual EV to EBIT today, which is different than our time evaluation, second forward year EV to EBIT, 18.82. 18.82. So again, what G is the market using? Uh, let's do a... Solver again, data. What if goal seek? So set cell 
was it F13 to 18.82 by changing, um, sorry, set cell F17. F17, there we go. So 3.4%. So these companies actually are fairly comparable, but here's the point. Why is Dollar General, now we do analysis. Why is Dollar General trading at a lower PE than Walmart? Because they're trading at a PE of 19 and Walmart's trading at a PE of 21. Why? Well, there's your data that leads to the PE. So why is Dollar General trading at a lower PE? Well, they have a higher ROE. They have very similar risks. So there's only one factor left, the growth. Lower G, 2.7 versus 3.5, even at a higher spread, this lower G is why Dollar General's trading at a lower multiple. Okay. If, just a little what if, they had the same G, they traded a higher multiple, 23, not 21. But they don't have a higher multiple because they don't have a higher G, their expected G is lower. So what do I know about Dollar General? <clears throat> I know that Dollar General is expected to have a higher return, higher spread than Walmart at similar risk. And Dollar General is not expected to grow as fast long-term as Walmart. That's what I know about the PE. That's the way that the PE is being priced in the real world today. What do I know about the EV to EBIT? Well, I know that Dollar General actually has on an operating basis, a higher EV to EBIT multiple than Walmart. It's, it's flipped. What's different? Well. Ironically, on an operating basis, their Gs are very similar, 3.3 three, and 3.4. Three, so why do they have a better multiple even if their ROIC is lower? Well, two things start to stick out. One is the tax rate, okay? So Dollar General has a lower tax rate. If their tax rate were 25%, it'd be a little worse, but that's part of it. So that's probably not the primary reason. So is it the 3.4 versus 3.3? That's not explaining it either. They have pretty similar growths. They have a lower spread. They have a lower tax rate. Why would this lower spread, would they trade at a higher multiple? This is the third factor. And this is the one that's often overlooked by the majority of people when they do the multiple analysis. The wax. <clears throat> when you discount a cash flow by a lower WAC, you get a higher value. So that's the point. It's two companies can have identical spreads, but one has a lower WAC than the other. The company with the lower WAC will actually have a higher value. So here's the point. If I made this 6.8%, then their multiples would be almost identical. So don't underestimate the impact of the risk. So in the case of Dollar General, <clears throat> the operating risk of Dollar General right now, lower WAC of 6.4, <clears throat> is viewed as beneficial to their multiple. That's why they're trading at a premium to Walmart on an EV to EBIT multiple. It's not because they have better growth. It's not because they have better spread. They have worse spread on operating basis. It's because they have a little bit lower risk. So why is Dollar General PE lower than Walmart's? Well, on a PE basis, we're talking about net income, which other things besides the operating performance can affect net income. Like for example, Walmart could be paying bigger dividends, buying back more stock. <clears throat> Their growth in net income might be faster, right? Even at a lower return, giving them a higher PE. But when you look at stripping out all of the debt and non-operating items, you look at the enterprise values, Dollar General's enterprise value right now is a little bit better than Walmart's because there's a little bit less perceived risk in the operating cash flows that are driving 
the EV multiples. Does everybody see how we did this? Does anybody have questions about how we did this? Because this is your next homework assignment. In your next homework assignment, I'm gonna give you three companies. <clears throat> and for those three companies, you're gonna do this. You're gonna calculate all of this. And you're gonna do a 500 word write-up minimum that explains the differences in the multiples as we just did with Walmart and Dollar General. And the key is, and the words that we're gonna use is that Walmart is trading at a premium to Dollar General, lingo, <clears throat> NPE. Dollar General is trading at a premium to Walmart in EV to EBIT, said a different way. Dollar General is trading at a discount to Walmart, lower multiple than the others, called a discount. Here for the EV to EBIT multiple, Walmart's trading at a discount to Dollar General. But the real question is, why are they trading at premiums or discounts to each other? What's causing it? These are the key value drivers that explain these multiples. These are the key value drivers that explain these multiples. So that's the write-up. <clears throat> so just as I said, why is Walmart's PE higher than Dollar General's? Well, given that they both have very similar cost of equities of 7.4% and 7.5%, even though Dollar General has a higher spread, 44%, minus 7.5% is much higher than 20% minus 7.4. The lower G of 2.7 at Dollar General versus Walmart's 3.5% is why Dollar General's PE is only 19. And that's why they're trading at a discount to Walmart's 21. Why is Dollar General trading at a premium to Walmart in the EV to EBIT multiple? <clears throat> because even though they have a lower tax rate of 22.75% against Walmart's 25%, <clears throat> and even though they have very similar growths of 33 and 3.4% respectively, Walmart, which also has a higher spread of 14 minus 6.8, or about a seven point spread, versus Dollar General, which has 12.4 minus six, by a six point spread. Even though Dollar General has that six point spread at similar growth, because Dollar General has a lower whack of 6.4% versus Walmart 6.8%, that's the actual reason Dollar General is trading at a premium to Walmart of 18.8 times EV to EBIT versus Walmart trading at 16.5 times EV to EBIT. So when I say write it up, that's what I mean. That's what you're writing up, okay? Questions about any of this? Because this is what you're gonna have to do. Now the question is you're gonna do three companies. One more real quick. PGT. So let's do target. PGT, how fast can I do target? <clears throat> Second forward year net income, 7144. <clears throat> Return in equity for target. What's representative? 55, 59, 59, 40 starts to go down. So what do I think is really representative? I think I'm gonna put 45 as more representative closer to 40. Okay. What's their cost of equity? Whack, cost of equity 8% and 7.3 in here, eight. And down here, 7.3. What is their <clears throat> multiples? Current PE, second forward year is 14.5. So 14.5. PE, second forward, or EV to EBIT for target, second forward year is 12.18. <clears throat> So Target is clearly trading at a discount to both Walmart and Dollar General. We need to find out why. <clears throat> do they do tax rate guidance? I hope they do. Oh. They do not. Uh, TA. Oh. 
All right, they're not talking about that in the transcripts. ERC, ERC. Oh. Let's see, there's a JP Morgan report. Like I said, JP Morgan usually has tax rate in it. Here we go, 22%. And for ROIC, I'll grab it off of the RV screen. <clears throat> Custom. Not finding my operating or IC. That's really weird. Uh, do I have a okay, operating spread somewhere in here? <clears throat> All right. Uh, there it is. Operating ROIC around 25%, not too different than their Bloomberg ROIC. So 25%. <clears throat> so solver, data. Uh, what if, goal seek. So I wanna set cell. I get the actual PE is 14.5. Paste. Copy that over. Formula. Copy that over. Paste. Copy it over. Paste. <clears throat> uh, what if coal seek? Set cell here to 14.5. By changing here. So target, and I can already see this, is trading at a discount because they have a very low expected G of 1.3%, even though they have a similar spread as Walmart and Dollar General, much higher spread than Walmart, similar spread to Dollar General. What's going on in the EV to EBIT multiple? <clears throat> it's that 1.3 that's really hurting target. I bet they have a lower G in the EV to EBIT as well. So uh, what was it? Data. What if coal seek set cell uh, here to 12.18 by changing that? And I'll be willing to bet you a dollar that that's also around 1%. So, why is Walmart trading at a discount? Walmart's trading at a discount. Be, or sorry, Target's trading at a discount to Walmart because they have a G of 1% versus Walmart's 3%. And that's why they're trading at 12 times earnings, even though they have a better spread. They also have a higher WAC. And this high WAC is also hurting their multiple. You can see that, but if you change that to 6.8, their multiple would be higher, okay? So two things are hurting targets EV to EBIT, higher WAC and lower G, 1.2 versus 3.3, 7.3 versus 6.8. That's why they're trading at a discount to Walmart, clearly trading at a discount to Dollar General, same reason. And again, why is Target trading at a discount to Walmart and Dollar General for PE, lower G, even though they have a very high spread? All right, so I'm gonna give you three companies. Monday, this coming week, you're gonna to have to do this analysis with these three companies that I give you. You're gonna to have to create the template you're gonna to have to write the 500 words and you're gonna to have to submit this by 7 a.m. So you have two deadlines next week. One is your group projects are due Monday. Two, this multiple assignment is due Monday. Individual multiple assignment, group project due Monday, 
If you have any questions, TAs have office hours later this week. This video will be posted in the next few minutes. Have a good week. See everybody on Monday. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.